Good afternoon, my friends. This is the Grim Flayer. Hope everybody out there is doing very well today. We've got a minor but warranted, in my view, change of plans on this channel. So I've been saying that I was going to do Horizon Spoilers Part 4, where we look at the final batch of cards, and then a Part 5 where we do a wrap-up, a conclusion, figure out what inferences and conclusions we can draw from the set taken holistically. However, the sad truth is that there's not much to talk about in the final batch of spoilers, so what we're going to do instead is briefly touch on a few pseudo-remarkable cards from there, and then go straight into our conclusions. So, we're going to touch on a few cards, and then we're going to go into my top five picks for the most BG Rock playable in Modern cards from Modern Horizons. We also are going to get into, um, in a separate video later on, probably tomorrow, three separate deck lists that I have drawn up for uh, your viewing, your feedback, whatever the case may be. We're going to get into some more direct theory crafting as far as how these cards actually fit into lists, but that will come later. So here we're still talking about the cards specifically, um, in and of themselves, and in and of the context of our favorite deck, Golgari Midrange. So, uh, thank you, as always, to all Patreon supporters, and without further ado, let's talk about these cards. Alright, so first up, we'll briefly talk about the card Winding Way. Now, I didn't really expect to see a card like this when they just kind of, you know, vomited out the remaining cards on the final day of spoilers, and this one is deceptively good. Now, I don't think it fits in, in stock Golgari lists. I don't think that's really where we want to be. It's a little too slow, a little too dirtily, but it's almost there. Like, um, it's a consistency tool kind of at both ends of the spectrum. If we're very light on lands, we need to hit the land drops. You name land, you reveal the top four, you fill up the graveyard, which did get better for us to do with Unearth in the deck now. And, of course, this is going to not only make sure you are almost guaranteed to hit more land drops, even if by some horrible stroke of luck you do not, it thins out your deck from non-land cards and allows you to hit those land drops with future top decks with a higher likelihood. The, uh, the inverse is also true. If it's the late game, you can thin the deck out of lands and just draw to gas, draw to creatures. However, this falls a little bit short still because it's a little dirtily because it's also never drawing us to direct answer cards. We're not hitting Planeswalkers off of this, we're not hitting instant sorceries, we're not hitting artifacts in post-sideboard games, so this doesn't quite cut it, but I did want to mention it because people have asked me, number one, if it's good. I, I always want to want to address those concerns, and also, um, it is worth noting that, again, it maybe gets a little bit more appealing with Unearth, and maybe it could, in theory, find its way into a specific, specific rock variant, whether it be Traverse or, or what have you, but as for our stock lists, as for straight-up regular old Golgari midrange, I will say, do not include this card in your deck as of right now. Next up, my friends, we'll talk about Defile, which is another common that came out right at the end of the spoiler season, and uh, what can you say about this one? It is so close yet so far. Um, see my analysis of Dead of Winter for my thoughts on this. In a previous video, I talked at length about Dead of Winter. All of those same arguments apply to, to this card, Defile, um, and namely, we play a perishingly few number of swamps in our deck relative to what you might assume at first glance or without having run the numbers in a two-color deck. You know, we've got to play a ton of swamps, right? Well, really not that many, especially with nourishing, nurturing peatland now in the deck. We just probably play even fewer swamps than we used to, and Defile is unfortunately pretty dependent on a critical mass of swamps that we cannot bring to bear, and as nice as it would be to have access to more five uh, copies, five, six, or even beyond of one mana instant speed removal. That is something that this deck lacks. Uh, Defile is not worth warping the mana base for. It is a shame. Like I said, so close, yet so far. And finally, my friends, before we get into the top five, we're going to talk about one more new card, and that is Shatter Assumptions. Now, some people were very excited about this card, 
It's a three mana sorcery speed discard spell. You choose one, the opponent reveals their hand and discards all colorless non-land cards, or they do the same thing with all multicolored cards. So the applications of the first mode are a little bit more obvious. So the second mode, is the second mode playable? And ultimately it's not in modern. Like the decks that play a ton of multicolored permanents are generally, or cards in general, are generally still not playing that many. You look at blue-white control, or even other, you know, three-color control decks, three-color mid-range decks, um, decks that play a fair amount of gold permanents like spirits, they just still play so many cards that are not multicolored, right? So the blowout potential is not even that high. Um, I guess the big exception to this is that new five-color Niv-Mizzet deck, which, sure, if you want to tech against this, then <laughs> by all means, go for it, but ultimately, that multicolored mode, given the other restrictions of the card, you know, three mana sorcery, and the fact that it's a discard, remember how dead our one mana discard can become, right? This is a three mana discard spell I really wish to emphasize just how much the stars have to align for this card to be good. And even if they do, the payoff for the multicolored cards is not really there in the format as things stand. However, I think most people, to be fair, were more excited when they saw Colorless because, of course, the great enemy, the great nemesis of midrange, Tron, this definitely can get a nice 2-for-1, 3-for-1, or even potentially beyond against Tron. Here is the problem. This is a, yet another 3-mana effect that shines against Tron, which of course, in our deck that does not accelerate on mana, is not going to cut it on the draw. And again, even if we're on the play, the same things still apply, you know, it, it gets dead quickly, it's a bad top deck just like discard, and it's clunky. Unlike our one mana discard, it is still clunky in our deck, it is still arguably better, better against Tron to go turn one discard and then use your turn three for Fulminator Mage or Liliana of the Veil or something, rather than trying to discard them beginning on turn three. Now, um, that is just even more true against the artifact decks of the format, against War Prison, against Affinity, against Hardened Scales. You know, they empty their hands a lot more quickly. This is a lot more of a potential liability in those matchups, and the, uh, the ceiling is also much lower. Um, this is arguably actually best against Eldrazi Tron, which does not have a binary all-or-nothing kind of plan with its mana acceleration like traditional Tron does. So you are fairly likely to get a nice two-for-one or better against Eldrazi Tron. Uh, so, you know, there, there are worse cards to tech against that deck specifically with, but, you know, ultimately, I would not advise playing this card. I think we've just got so many better cards for, for those matchups, and it does not really flex effectively beyond the Tron variants, if you ask me. So, um, you know, it's a cool card. I'm glad it's in existence. There could be a world in which this becomes correct to play uh, at some point in the future, but, but right now, I think we need to say no thank you to Shatter Assumptions. All right, my friends, so my choice for number five Fifth on the list of the top five most playable cards in Golgari Midrange from Modern Horizons is Force of Despair. Now, the first thing I will say here is that this could easily have been Force of Vigor. Force of Vigor is actually probably a safer pick. It might even be an overall better card in a vacuum. Force of Vigor is a really solid card. Here's the thing, though. Number one in Golgari, we cannot necessarily assume we're going to have the green card to pitch. Our deck is heavily black and also has its fair share of colorless stuff out of the side. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know if we can just assume that pitching a green card in our specific two-color deck is going to be as live as a lot of people might think. Um, the, the second point against Force of Vigor, why it did not quite make my top five, is that I don't believe we strictly need this effect. We just have so many cards that are already main deckable, that do hit artifacts, that do hit enchantments. We just don't need that aspect of our gameplay shored up with a really, uh, you know, kind of high ceiling, but 
arguably low floor card as well relative to something like Abrupt Decay. So uh, as good as Force of Vigor is, again, maybe better than Force of Despair in a vacuum. For our archetype, I think Force of Despair edges it out for the fifth place slot. Now, um, don't get me wrong, Force of Despair is the highest variance Force card by far. Um, but the reason it makes my list is because it does something that none of our other cards do. This lets us answer in an extremely efficient way an opponent flooding the board nice and early. Now, don't get me wrong. All of the criticisms of this card are correct. It is very unusual, and not in a good way, that this is an extremely dead top deck. Like, if there's one thing that shouldn't be a dead top deck in the matchups where you want it, it's a removal spell. And if you're behind on the board, this is a very dead top deck, at least for the moment, you know, at least until they find something else, at which point you can answer it with Force of Despair, but you're still behind on the board. So that's such a valid criticism, I'm not denying that at all. But what I want to draw everybody's attention to is the fact that no other tool in our arsenal does this. Like, our best, most unconditional board wipe, or, or even, you know, two-for-one effect, I guess, is Damnation. It's probably the most unconditional two-for-one to, to the board that we have, and that's a four-mana sorcery. Force of Despair, you can cast this on before you even untap. You know, if the opponent's on the play, they have a really aggressive affinity start or a really aggressive hollow one start, dumping out a couple hollow ones. Force of Despair is our best possible answer to something like that. Now, again, I understand the limitations. That has to be in your opening hand. It's going to be a high-variance card, but... It's very hard castable, so if, let's say we don't have the best case scenario for it, but we also don't have the worst case scenario for it where we're behind on board and we need to top deck an answer and we top deck this. Let's say it's just kind of an even game. Well, this is a very fine top deck in an even game where a removal is good because, of course, you can, depending on the situation, either tap out and have this as, as the kind of uh, break glass in case of emergency button if you really need to two for one yourself or two for two, you know, if the opponent has a nice double spell turn. Or you can simply hard cast it. And then when we hard cast it, this actually starts to, to be a potential two for one for us in those types of situations. So um, I think this is the most, this is the highest variance of the force cycle, and it's also the highest variance card in our uh, top five here. But again, the uniqueness of it and the fact that it is a free spell, remember my analysis of Nether Spirit from my previous video, never underestimate the potential power of free spells. So, all things considered, we're going to need a lot of people uh, testing this card. We're going to have a lot of games with people uh, casting Force of Despair, or maybe top decking it and not casting it and losing, as the case may be, before we as a community can come to a consensus about this card, where it fits, whether it's worth a spot, but... I think it has a unique enough effect and a high enough po uh, potential power ceiling that it does make the top five most playable cards from this set. Coming in at number four, my friends, is our friend, the, the Collector Oof. And I have been reliably informed by my viewers that it is indeed Oof and not Oof. So thank you for that. <laughs> We're calling it the Oof from now on. And... I, I just love everything about this card. As I said when I broke it down initially, I don't usually go in for the wackier, zanier type of, of versions of, of art and, and effects and, uh, and flavor text and all that stuff, but you just can't not like the oof. It's just so well done on every level, and it's not just pure kind of flavorful humor either. There's a sinister aspect to this guy. Look at him. You look at that wicked grin, you know? I don't, <laughs> I'm just going to give him my artifacts and say, hey man, I don't want any trouble. Like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's oddly Golgari, isn't it? So, um, and it is arguably the least variance card in this top five compared to Force of Despair. Like, this is just a slam dunk good card to have in our archetype. It's just a stony silence on legs. So why is it only down at number four? Well, as I said when I initially broke this card down, we just don't strictly need a stony silence style effect. Um, that doesn't mean one is not welcome. It's very welcome. But I have said for a long time that one of the reasons I think Rock is better than Absin is because 
green black doesn't really need a stony silence effect and that hasn't changed we still don't need one however it is going to be really nice to have one and the fact that it is a creature rather than an enchantment like its counterpart stony silence is potentially a feature and not a bug specifically against the Tron matchup where not only do we need to disrupt them but we need to clock them as well and where their removal spells are relatively few and far between so um, just the the mere existence of Tron the mere existence of artifact all index means that this guy is a great minimum one of in your board I think two is playable I don't think more than two is necessary at this moment again because we do have a pretty good matchup against most artifact-based decks. But the oof, uh, definitely a solid, solid one. And who knows, if some of these higher-placed cards on my list don't pan out, or if the meta changes, this guy could rise all the way to number one. But right now, he's a very solid, very comfortable fourth-place spot from Modern Horizons. Coming in here at number three is the Carrier. The Carrier of Plagues, the Plague Engineer, and uh, I'm very excited about this card. I have been from day one. I think this is going to be a sweet, sweet addition. Really unique effect to have in the format. I am a fan. And much like with, uh, with our friendly Oof from the previous slot, it may be a feature more than a bug, at least in some matchups it will be, that it is a, uh, a creature with Death Touch, no less, unlike its counterpart from Legacy, Engineered Plague. Um, it's also not symmetrical, which is arguably the biggest upgrade of all it gets over Engineered Plague. Again, easier to remove for sure, but with three potential upsides over Engineered Plague, so I think this card is great. Shout out here to Flying Delver, who just posted a great rundown of Modern Horizons, you know, kind of the aftermath on greatness at any cost.com including a sample rock list, um, which actually has two copies of Engineer, one of them main. And I love that. And the other thing that I'm going to say here is that on my uh, for my Patreon supporters once per month, for those who don't know, I do a scouting report. Now, this is on an enemy archetype. Uh, it has been all the way up until this month. Um, my people in the confidant tier and above vote. And I write about whatever they want me to write about, whichever opposing deck. So we've done Tron, we've done Is It Phoenix, we've done Spirit, so on and so forth. They vote, I write about it, we do a deep dive talking about everything there is to talk about, uh, you know, how to play against that deck. My Patreon supporters this month voted overwhelmingly for, and unanimously, for Blue-White Control. But I said, hey... I love that. It's a great choice right now, but let's wait until Modern Horizons, the dust settles from it. So we're going to do blue-white next month after they've had a chance to make their own Horizons changes. And this month, instead of that, I am doing a deep dive on Plague Engineer where we look at the top 30 decks in the format. I give Plague Engineer a rating on the Plague scale going from one, you know, vaccinated to 10 bubonic plague or something like that and we see how good plague engineer is in the format we talk about what types to name and you know other little tips and tricks for using plague engineer to its fullest in those matchups i haven't quite finished yet but that might be published tonight or tomorrow hopefully at the latest but the the reason i mention that is because the more i look at the applications of this card in across all matchups in the meta the more I am excited about this guy. So, very, very cool card. Very, very unique effect. Um, arguably the most unique new effect we're getting in, in our archetype. And I couldn't be more pumped. So, you know, it remains to be seen exactly how impactful it will be. Obviously, it's a little slow at 3 mana and might not necessarily get kills the moment it resolves, depending on how the game has progressed. And obviously, it's not the very best in, in a whole lot of matchups that don't really play much to the board. But all that said, the, uh, the effect is great, the upside is huge, and I think it's going to slot really nicely into our overall strategy. So Plague Engineer officially Grimflayer MTG approved, and I look forward to casting this card in the future. He comes in at number three on our list. And here at number two is the brand new to modern technology of a very old card dating back to Urza's legacy called Unearth. And 
maybe this is optimistic. You know, I think other cards like Plague Engineer and Collector Oof are actually a little bit more of a sure thing in our archetype, just because we don't really have to change anything that we're doing, and those cards can just kind of slot into our strategy. Whereas Unearth, you know, it might be a little bit more of a, of a slight build-around card. Now, that's not... It's not a necessarily complete build around, of course, because it has Cycling 2. And without Cycling 2, we probably wouldn't even really be interested in it because it could just too often be dead, too often be hosed by opposing graveyard hate. But So this card, it's the, the hardest to predict, predict of these top five, besides maybe Force of Despair, how exactly it will pan out. But I'm high on this card. A lot of other people are high on this card. We have some Unearth skeptics, too. So, hey, maybe they're right. That's why I'm, I'm putting the asterisk here behind it, uh, despite it being at number two. But this gives us so many options. It gives us a form of card selection, provided we have a big enough graveyard to, to choose from a couple different options. It gives us some consistency in the deck because, again, we can buy back a threat that helps us not only consistently keep a threat on the board, but also further build on consistency. For example, buying back a tireless tracker if we have lands in hand to further ensure that we're curving out, further ensure that we've got the late game inevitability and, and advantage. And, of course, in and of itself, you know, cycling to... Uh, we, we have a lot of cards that are potentially dead in game one, and uh, no real way to, to turn them into new gas. We can escalate a collective brutality or have a pitch that we don't mind losing losing to uh, Liliana, the, uh, excuse me, Liliana of the Veil plus one, but no real way to turn those dead cards into a brand new card. But with Unearth, we do. So again, even if it's dead, you can cycle it. So in the fact that it's got the ability to really uh, for a change, give us a tempo positive play. We're one of the one of the worst tempo decks in modern. We uh, discard, of course, is our kind of premier form of interaction, and that's a tempo negative form of interaction. And then beyond that, we're doing very tame uh, tempo neutral plays. Like you know, I play my two two my two drop for two mana, not cheating on mana, not powering anything out ahead of curve with mana acceleration. Not doing anything completely busted as far as mana production goes. So, um, But Unearth allows us to invest one mana into, for example, a 3-drop. We return a Tireless Tracker or a Fulminator Mage directly to the battlefield for only one mana, and then we can immediately activate the Fulminator, or we can immediately play a land and start accruing value with Tireless Tracker. Now, so Unearth has huge, huge potential to just really streamline the deck, really give it a little velocity, a little bit of, of power, um, and card selection all in one neat little package that the floor on it is, again, just cycle it away for two and look at a fresh card. Um, remains to be seen how much we will want to enable Unearth. Um, I am considering, which again you'll see on my upcoming video about some, you know, involving some new lists, I'm considering leveraging main deck technology like Collective Brutality and Grim Flayer in small numbers, but still there, that are fine cards on their own that also make Unearth better. So, it remains to be seen whether it's worth doing that, or whether we just want to jam Unearth into existing decks with as few changes as possible, or whether we want to build around it even more, or, I guess, whether it's just not as good as we think it's going to be. But either way, the uh, the prospect of Unearth is a very appealing one as things stand right now, so it comes in at number two on my list of the top five cards from Modern Horizons. And last but certainly not least, quite the opposite, last but best, we have Nurturing Peatland at number one. Now, feels a little bit like... You know, a little anticlimactic, a little bit like I'm cheating to put the land at number one. It's just a little boring, right, to put the land at number one, but what can I say? It is just the clearly, you know, best card for us, I think, in, in the whole set. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not a totally free inclusion. It's not a strict upgrade over anything we're already playing. However, we all know, like invested modern players, experienced modern players, we all know 
how powerful the card Horizon Canopy is. And now, of course, we have a Canopy in our colors, and we're only a two-color deck, so we can leverage this so much better than any of the three-color BGX decks. This is just kind of tailor-made for us, and um, our mana base as it stands is already relatively painless, so I think we can very clearly afford two. Um, it's possible that that's not even ambitious enough and we can play all the way up to three. That I don't know, because it also remains to be seen, like, there's a lot of, a lot of shaking up of the mana base going on lately. We have the new technology of Blast Zone, which is colorless, which is a big, uh, big downside, but of course a very powerful effect trying to muscle its way into a lot of our mana bases. We still have the pressing need for Fields of Ruin with Tron and Blue-White Control, and Valakut, and other decks where th their mana base really matters, and it's really important to be able to disrupt it, all at the top tables. So, uh, And then, of course, we can expect Burn to make a comeback, thanks to the... Uh, presence of these Horizon lands in, in Modern. They're going to be ubiquitous, and Burn is going to take advantage of that, both by it being really good in their deck, and by them preying upon opposing decks using Pain lands, right? So, um, there's a whole lot to take into account. So, I, th I think starting off with two of these is probably the safest bet, but realistically speaking, this is just the most slam-dunk inclusion of all, in my opinion. Um, and again, there's a lot to be said for it. Does this make Tireless Tracker a little bit less necessary? Or does this just work especially well with Tracker? It, it might be both, actually. Like, it, it, we, we just might not need the Flood Insurance of Tracker as much, because now we have a little Flood Insurance built into our mana base. But at the same time, this is really good with Tracker. Like, it just keeps the value train rolling even better once you're hitting those high land counts. So, and also... How, what does this do to Urborg Tomb of Yawgmoth? Do we want to leverage Urborg for not only more consistent black mana production in our deck, turning treetop villages and fields of ruin and blast zones into black producing sources, but it also lets us uh, have painless black production out of our peatlands. So there's a lot to figure out with this land, but it is the number one card for us from Modern Horizons in my view. Start off with two in your deck. If you're ambitious, maybe even start off with three. But this is a slam dunk, and I am so happy, my friends, so, so happy that we have access to it in our archetype. All right, my friends, so that was my rundown of Modern Horizons. And, you know, as we just scroll through the, the full set here, you know, starting with the Mythics, let's be honest, a lot of people are complaining about this, and, yeah, you know, there's... Everybody, everybody's got a little bit of something that they didn't see. But just look at these cards. I think they did an amazing job on this set. I think the, the art, the theme, everything is really, really cool. They've got a whole lot of variety in here. They don't seem to have put any current Tier 1 deck over the top with it. Of course, as of right now, you know, things are really... Nobody can predict what's going to happen. There's going to be some busted stuff that nobody saw coming, I'm sure. But, like, look at this set. It's really, really cool. And uh, the one thing that I will say is that people are complaining that a lot of cards are not that modern playable. It's Commander Horizons. It's whatever. Um... I would say to that, I understand, uh, but be careful what you wish for, because one of the reasons we love Modern is that it is a non-rotating format, right? So we don't want our really good staples to get outclassed, like ever, maybe, especially now that it's clear they're not making Modern into Legacy without their reserve list. They're keeping the Modern and Legacy distinctions, uh, you know, clearly demarcated, so... Do we really want our Tarmogoyfs and our Lilianas and our Thought Seizes to be outclassed? I don't. I, I want to play with those cards for as, as long as I'm playing Modern, which is, uh, which is going to be for the foreseeable future. So, in my opinion, yeah, be careful what you wish for. I think, uh, I think this set is the appropriate power level. I think it's absolutely perfect in that regard. The one thing I will say is that I expected them to be a little bit more aggressive with how they reprinted Legacy Staples. And a little less aggressive with how they printed brand new technology. So, I... I, I arguably would have preferred to see more Legacy cards than we did. Uh, especially playable ones, but... 
that might be just my love for the uh, old school foiling process really biasing me there. So uh, no complaints here overall about Modern Horizons, but I did expect them to be a little bit more aggressive with the Legacy stuff. But hey, now we know, like I said, that Modern and Legacy are going to have very distinct identities going forward. Modern is not really turning into Legacy Light. It's going to be its own thing and remain that way. Ditto for Legacy. So if nothing else, that does allow us to predict Modern Horizons 2 a little bit more accurately when it comes out. But overall, those are my top five. Those are my thoughts on the set as a whole. All right, my friends, thank you so much for watching. As always, thank you so much again to my Patreon supporters. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you got anything else you'd like to sneak into the top five. Let me know what you thought about these ones that we did the brief drive-by on. We looked at Winding Way, Defile, Shatter Assumptions. I don't really see any of those, but if, uh, if you've got a case to be made, please let me know in the comments below. And like I said, stay tuned to the channel because I'm going to be showing you three um, brand new deck lists that I will be iterating on the, for your feedback and, and for your edification. And of course, once the cards are live on this channel, we are going to be playing with them. I'm going to do a sealed event the first day it's available, if I have the time. And then from there, we're going to get back into the Modern Leagues full bore. So stay tuned. Thanks again for watching. Look forward to hearing from you, and I will talk to you soon. Hope everybody out there has a wonderful, wonderful day.